So here I am logged in as the user Joe. Let's look at some key files that are associated with users in their home directory. And so if I do an ls hyphen alh, we can see some of those. The key ones that we're going to talk about here are dot profile, dot bash rc, um, dot bash logout, and dot bash history. So dot bash history is one that, if you take a look, you can see all the commands I've gone in and I have typed as the user Joe. Every time I type a command, I'm able to save it, and that's because as the up arrow is hit, you're able to go through that. Now, commands that you type right now aren't written directly to bash history. They're written after you log out. So that bash history file contains a lot of information, especially if you've typed, for example, a password in plain text or something. So let's look at um, dot bash logout, and when you type exit or you exit out of a shell, this is essentially the only thing that happens here. And this is the point when um, your bash history is written out at logout. So anything that gets put there, you could have some malicious stuff that's put there. For example, when you log out, um, I could add something here that's like echo, or I could cat, uh, like I could do something like cat Etsy password and then pipe it to netcat and send it off to some remote computer. This is not what the command would look like. We haven't talked about this yet. Um, but I could take you know sensitive information every time you log out and I could export it off the computer, for example. So you wanna make sure that bash logout is clear. Let's do a pico on dot bash RC. And this is where we can modify our history size. So I can take the history size here and uh, I can say, okay, we want zero and zero. And now this user will not retain any of that information in the history file. Now the downside is you will no longer be able to use the up arrow because that those commands won't be in your history file, but that is certainly a uh, secure setting. We also have some environment variables set here. So here's an environment variable that defines what your prompt looks like. And you can do some Googling for PS1 modify your bash shell, and you can make it look um, different than it does right now. So for example, that's the PS1 environment variable. I'll show you how to see what that looks like. But you can see that it shows my username at, and then this IP address, and then my home directory, right? That's that environment variable that we were just looking at. And if I echo dollar sign PS1, just like we saw there, we can see what that environment variable looks like. And uh, you can look up some interesting tutorials on how to modify the color, what your shell is displaying, what it's not. Uh, that's fully customizable. And there are a lot of different environment variables um, that are sort of active here for any given user. And let's take a look at them because you echo and then a dollar sign. For example, I could do user. That's one way to see what your username is. Another one is to type who am I? Same thing, right? Um, another one, there's just a lot. If you look up common um, environment variables, uh, you can find a whole list of them. Let's try OS type and see if that works. There we go, Linux new. In any event, um, that is what's going on with that PS1. That's what your shell is doing. We're also going to see aliases set up here. So an alias is a command. Like when we type ls, we're actually typing ls color auto. And so let's say I wanted to create one. You want to look through this, and I'll give you a tip for doing that. Uh, alias uh, cat equals, and if I were to do echo, um one two three four five six let's say now every time i type cat instead of actually reading a file it's just going to echo one two three four five six every time so i'll save that and we'll exit it now watch what happens if i type cat one two three all right well there's nothing here called one two three so let's do a cat uh my my file dot text it cats one two three because 
myfile.txt actually has one, two, three inside of it, right? Um, in order for this bash RC to become active, you have to log out and then log back in because dat, dot bash RC takes effect when the user logs in. So if I do an su Joe and I cat my file dot text now, you'll see it says one, two, three, four, five, six, my file dot text, right? And, uh, and so that alias has sort of taken control here and it's not doing what we think it's doing. So that dot bash RC file is something you want to check for aliases. So I could, um, well, first of all, I'm going to get rid of what was in there. And because I was going to use the cat command to kind of check that out. Okay, so now I've logged out, logged back in. That cat alias should no longer be there. I could cat.bashrc and then grep for the word alias. And we'll see all of the aliases um, that are active here. And so we can kind of get a heads up. And we can see some of them are prefaced with this um, number sign. And these number signs represent comments. So these aren't active. So I could take that grep command and I could say, okay, show me everything that has alias in it, but eliminate anything that has a number sign as well. And this might give a false result here, but it would narrow it down a little bit more if there are a lot of results. So I could grep for alias, and then I could take all of those results and do a grep hyphen V, which is search for anything that doesn't match this. Um, and I need to backslash escape this number sign here. And so this will find everything that has the line alias, and then it'll eliminate everything that has a number sign. And we'll get a list back of only things that are in dat bash RC that start with the word alias. And now we can see all of the aliases that are being loaded in at the time that we log in to this user shell. Now, dot profile is important. This is a, an important concept here. I'm going to pico dot profile, and you'll see here that it's setting our path variable, and uh, it's including our home, okay, um, home slash bin. So if we created a folder called bin, that would be in our path. We don't have that right now, and um, It will include the directories that are in the path environment variable. So let's take a look at that path environment variable. Uh, this is why when we type commands like ls or cat or cd or anything at all, they work is because the system searches through the path. It works like this as Windows, uh, with Windows as well. And if it finds a program that matches, it will execute that program. Um, and so the system path, I could do it a couple of different ways. I could echo path like this, and we can see that, okay, when I type a command, it's going to look in user local s bin. It's going to look in user local bin, and it's going to try to find a, an executable that matches what I typed in all of those folders to see whether or not it exists, and if it does, it'll run it. And that path is located in Etsy environment. Okay, that's the folder that contains the path. And I'm not logged in as root right now, so I can't change this. But these folders are going to be important to check uh, and keep an eye on to see whether or not there have been any binaries that have been replaced or anything that isn't right. And we'll talk about how to sort of verify all those folders to make sure that there isn't anything kind of funny going on there. Um, in later videos but you want to make sure that nothing crazy has been added either so the path uh, should remain relatively stable there shouldn't be a lot of changes to the path uh, from the time you know you install Ubuntu to the time you see it in, an, in a production environment there's not a lot of reason to change that path And let me just demonstrate that. So if I were to type ls, it's going to search the path and try to find that, right? Um, let's use the locate command, which isn't installed by default on this distribution, and let's locate ls. Try to find it. It's going to tell you, well, locate hasn't been installed, so I'm going to apt install mlocate. 
and I need to do that as root. And in order for locate to have a current snapshot of the image, it's good to run update db. And that'll make sure that the system is up to date. And now when we run locate, it will hopefully find what we're looking for. So I'm going to locate for ls and I'm going to grep for, well, let's do echo path first. We can see here's our path. And now I'm going to locate ls and I'm going to grep for bin because most of these have bin in them, right? And we'll see that the ls folder, there's a lot of those. So we need to sort of refine this here. So I'll grep, I'll locate ls, and I'll put a space at the end because it should be the last thing. That didn't work. Hold on. Let's try something different. Let's try the cat command because we know that works. Locate cat, and I'll grep for bin. And we can see here that we have user bin cat. Okay, there's actually the only one in here that ends with the word cat. And I could have done regex, I guess, where I looked for anything that ends with cat. But we see we have our cat executable in user bin. And if I echo path, we can see that user bin is indeed in our system path. Therefore, when I run cat, all right, it knows to it's executing that cat right there. And we can also run to make sure that we can run which cat. Uh, the word which will tell us where the computer is finding it in the path. So all of those are important concepts uh, when you're dealing with users and groups, knowing that all of these files here that are hidden with the dot are going to be important uh, in terms of user interaction and what's happening on the system.